In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Amorites, they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch, he was walking about on the roof of the king's house. They saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she said and told David, I'm pregnant. This is the word of the Lord. I know that's not a Christmas story we just read. It has nothing at all to do with Christmas. Except that if you believe Matthew, it has everything to do with Christmas. We've been looking at the women in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. We've talked about Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. And this week we have Bathsheba. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. Words from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, Act 2, Scene 2. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. One of the first things David did when he was a young man was slay Goliath, the Philistine giant. But after that, David sort of became a giant in and of himself. He sent the Philistines off and running. The Philistines were Israel's perpetual nemesis, and now they need not worry about them anymore. And even though the people loved King Saul, the king for whom they had begged for years, they grew to love David even more. Saul has slain his thousands they used to sing in the victory parades. But David, his tens of thousands. David was the one who took the twelve scattered tribes of Israel and made a united nation out of them. David was the one who finally defeated the Jebusites who lived on top of Mount Zion. No one could take the Jebusites until David did which allowed them to build the city of Jerusalem on top and make a capital, Jerusalem, for this new nation of Israel. They called it the city of David. He brought the Israelite military to its mightiest apex. He expanded the borders of Israel to their broadest parameters at the time. He ushered in an extended and celebrated peace in Israel. Is there any wonder why the Psalms in the Bible, most of them have uh, the prelude, a Psalm of David. Which doesn't mean David wrote them. In, prob in fact, it probably doesn't mean that at all. It probably means a Psalm for David. Or a Psalm about David. Or a Psalm when David was king. What it does in fact mean is that when David was king, the people of Israel were a singing people. They were a dancing people. They were writing music when David was king. He was Israel's greatest king in their entire history. The man, the myth, the legend, David. Rumor had it that even when the Messiah came, the Messiah would come as a, a son of David, which had very little to do with DNA 
and so very much to do with the golden age of Israel. When the Messiah comes, He will do it the way David did it. He will bring peace and victory in good days ahead. But power is a tricky thing. Power is a subtle thing. It can get into the heart and mind of a giant before they even realize it. It was the spring of the year, you know, when winter's over and it's okay to travel again back in those days. And so it was the season of the year when kings went out to war. But David stayed back in Jerusalem. Gone are the days when he led his people into battle as he did at first. Now he sits back and watches them. It seems as though he's gotten to the place in his life when he enjoys the privileges of power, but neglects the responsibilities that come with it. And one day, while David was smoking a cigar on the roof of his palace, no doubt the tallest building in Jerusalem, he looked down and saw Bathsheba bathing. He sends for her. She is brought to the palace where he lays with her. Given the power discrepancy and the way the story is told, lay with her is probably not the right way to say it. The entire story here between David and Bathsheba is told in five verses. And it's chock full of action verbs. The text doesn't say that David spoke a word to Bathsheba. Not a word between them. There's no conversation here. No words of affirmation. The text doesn't say that David experienced any internal angst over his actions. He doesn't argue with himself. There is no internal moral debate here. He just looks and sees and takes. His power has gone to his head. And the fact that she was the wife of one of his leading soldiers didn't even matter. He simply wanted something. And the power said to his brain, take it. And then there's Bathsheba, whose only words in this part of the story are, I'm pregnant. She is, at the beginning of the story, identified, as most women were in those days, by her husband and father. David summoned her, and when the king calls for you, you go. No questions asked. Part of me wonders if Bathsheba thought she was being summoned to the palace because someone had a word about her husband, Uriah, from battle. We don't know. All we know is that she went and was the object of David's pleasure. In these verses, David is the subject of the action and Bathsheba is the object. And you get the feeling that wasn't just true in a grammatical sense. Those five short verses changed her life. The pain she must have felt, the whispers from the other women around town, the internalized shame over the course of time. And now, David's actions cause her to have to act. Now she has to do something. There are people in this world, you know, who say that life is nothing more than the sum total of the choices you make. Life is nothing more than the choices you make. Good choices make a good life, and bad choices lead to a bad life. Nothing more than that. And while there may be a grain of truth in that, it's only a grain. Tell that to Bathsheba, who for the rest of her life had to live with someone else's choices. Sometimes life is vicious. It comes at you with swords and clubs. Sometimes you find yourself trapped under the dark underbelly of power. And when you're suffocating underneath it, you begin to wonder whether it's a good thing at all. The story of David and Bathsheba is a story of power. And it's told in five quick verses. And then it's over. Except it wasn't over for either one of them. This story totally altered the trajectory of David's life. Before chapter 11, he is the man, the myth, the legend, victorious in battle, righteous in judgment, pure in heart. After this point, his house is divided and the nation of Israel crumbles right behind it. 
before this story is over, the nation of Israel is a divided nation. And David, as a person, is broken. I mean broken by the guilt and the shame of what he has done. He cannot even recognize the person that power has made of him. And Bathsheba is broken over someone else's actions. The trajectory of her life was set by what happened on her very worst day. And so, in this story, we have one who is drunk on power and one who is dying of thirst from lack of it. We have one who is a glutton for dominion, taking things that aren't his to begin with. And another who lacks dominion altogether. We have one who is riding the beast of royalty and another who's being consumed by it. That's the thing about power, you know. It's kind of like food and drink. Too much or too little distorts your identity and begins to eat away at your humanity. And yet, if you read Jesus' genealogy, both David and Bathsheba are there. Maybe one of the reasons Jesus came to us was to help us to rethink power. To challenge those who have it to remember that power is meant to serve others, is subject to love and justice, and those who have it are responsible to God Almighty from whom all power and dominion is derived. And Jesus came to give power to those who had too little to remind us that God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong, to lift up those who had been weighed down by their sins or someone else's. And you can see it at the end of Jesus' life, at the cross, how Jesus at one and the same time offers forgiveness for every David who had abused his power by taking upon Himself the guilt, by absorbing all the guilt and the shame of the worst things we've done. And how at the cross Jesus offered empowerment for every Bathsheba by absorbing the pain and the agony of the worst things that have been done to us. Jesus took it all in in Himself. You can see at the cross that Jesus exposed the powers of this world for what they are. And He stood in solidarity with those who have too little and have been on the underbelly of power. Jesus came to help us reimagine what power really is, to redeem those who've been made monsters by their power, and to heal those who've been bitten by it. And it wasn't just at the end of His life that Jesus did this, but the beginning as well. Think on this with me today. What is the Christmas story? Seriously, what is the Christmas story if not a radical reimagining of what power really is in this world? And I guess the first sign that this is what God was up to is this. The angel split the heavens and said to the shepherds, Unto you is born this day in the city of David. No, not Jerusalem. That was the city of David the king. This was Bethlehem, the city of David the shepherd. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. A baby who is Lord. If that doesn't make you reimagine what power really is, if that doesn't invite you to reconsider your views of power that you've held all your life. Well, it's true, brothers and sisters, that Jesus was a son of David. It is just as true that Jesus was a son of Bathsheba, which is why He is good news of great joy for all the people. Hallelujah. Let's pray.
Oh Lord, we think we know what power is. We find ourselves hungering and thirsting for it. Seeking what is beyond ourselves. Striving for what lies outside our dominions. And then you come and are born in our midst as a helpless baby. Teach us, O oh God, the ways of true power. Give us the courage to walk in those ways. And give us the trust when we can't see past our next step. O oh Lord, help us to be good stewards of the power and the dominion that we have. To be servants. To be mild. To be humble. To be just. And grant us a divine sensitivity toward those who've had too little. So that we might live the Christmas story. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.